Thank you so much, and, and thank you, Mike, for the invitation to come here. We talked a couple of months ago about uh, this Sunday, and we've just been so excited thinking about coming and, and uh, being with you folks today. Uh, what a great church this is. Amen? Amen. <laughs> you know, I hope you know what you have here, because it's just something incredible. Um, I, uh, I have told Mike in the past, uh, probably a long time ago, but uh, I, I'd kinda like, I kind of wish I lived in Fairfield so I could attend that church because you have something very, very special. Love your leaders. Of course, Pastor Mike and Don are just special friends of ours. Um, I like to call Mike every now and then and just, just get encouraged or bounce ideas off him or ask him questions and discuss things with him. He's just a real gift in my life. Um, we've been here before, but it's been a while. Uh, we know some of you, and, and probably most of you don't know us, but uh, Corlin and I are both native Montanans. We were raised in the big city of Haver, and uh, uh, raised up in the Haver Church, the Haver Assembly of God Church, and uh, uh, probably didn't really notice one another until we were e young adults, but uh, we've been married 43 years. We have uh, three grown children. Uh, our son was serving the Lord in India with his family and recently moved to Dubai uh, to minister there. And then we have two daughters. Uh, uh, our middle child, Katie, is living with us, she and her husband and little girl, and uh, they're kind of in a time of transition right now, figuring out what their next step in life is. And our youngest daughter is single, and uh, she's been living in California for 10 years and recently moved back home. So we have a full house. Uh, we have uh, five grandchildren not living with us. Our son has four kids in Dubai. But we have uh, five grandchildren, and number six is arriving any day. In fact, she's, uh, Katie is due a week from today, so um, it's, it's baby watch time at our house, I'll tell you. As Mike mentioned, we've pastored for 40 years in Montana. That used to be old people. It's not anymore. Um, that changed, see. But uh, we... Pastored a church in Helena. We planted it in 1994 and pastored it for 22 years. But about seven years ago, we um, left the church and headed out in just a different direction, sensing God's tug on our hearts to do something different. We began a ministry called Leader to Leader Ministries, uh, just to reach out to leaders and pastors and leadership teams and churches and uh, bless leaders. There, there's an alarming number of pastors leaving the ministry these days because of discouragement, health issues, financial problems, a number of things. And that concerns us greatly. So we've been reaching out to leaders and encouraging them. And by the way, this church supports us monthly in that endeavor. And we thank you so much for that. A large part of our ministry is interim pastoring. When a church is going through transition, they will call us in and we'll spend whatever time is needed to help the church through transition and help them find new leadership. And uh, currently, we're traveling to Chinook every weekend and helping them as they've been without a pastor some months right now, for, for some months. So uh, it's, it's really a vital ministry. All right, would you pray with me today? Lord, thank you so much for this church. Holy Spirit, you're so welcome here. And as that song says, come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. We sense your presence in such a powerful way. And even as, I, as we sang earlier, right now I speak Jesus over this house in a fresh way. Please take the words of my mouth and your precious word and anoint it to us in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Being a pastor is, uh, is quite a life. I, it was in junior high when I began sensing something stirring in my heart 
that I'd one day be a pastor. I look back on that and I say that was my call, but when you're in junior high, you don't think about a call. I just thought someday I think I'm going to be a pastor. Um, it wasn't like my father was a pastor. Some, some dads are pastors and their son becomes one. My son did, but uh, my dad was a carpenter and my mom was a nurse. And um, It was interesting, too, when I mentioned to my father when I was in junior high, I said, you know, Dad, I think I'm supposed to be a pastor one day. I thought he'd be excited about that. He was a godly man. He'd gone through the Depression and he said to me, well, that's good, but you know, you ought to find a trade to fall back on. Because I think in the Depression days, he'd seen pastors practically starve to death because they didn't have a real job. <laughs> so that was an interesting response. Well, you know, time went by. I got into high school, later on into early college. I was going to Northern Montana College in Haver because I uh, just take taking general studies, trying to figure out life and so on. I even at that time headed out to Northwest College in Kirkland, Washington, uh, uh, which is a Bible college, of course, and, and I, I took some Bible courses. But I remember coming home from Northwest, and I said to the people, I said, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to be a pastor. I think that was just me. You ever say that when God nudges you? I wonder how many opportunities are lost because we've said, you know, I think that was just me. That couldn't have been God. I wonder if we ought to say, I think that's just God, <laughs> and watch doors open. Well, I said, I think that was just me, and so I settled into life in Haver, hired out on Burlington Northern Railroad, began a career there, I thought. Uh, was very involved in my home church, uh, met a beautiful young lady that I'd grown up with, and I just started to notice, named Corlin, and uh, we dated, and we eventually got engaged, and, and uh, got married in 1979. <clears throat> At that time, the church in Haver hired a young couple to come in as youth pastors. They were our age, so of course we weren't in youth group, but we became very close friends with this man and his wife. And uh, this fellow named Kyle, he would, Kyle would take me out to lunch occasionally, and he'd say, uh, what are you going to do with your life? What are your dreams? What are your goals? What is God calling you to? I'd say, well, I'm doing it. I'm working for BN." He said, no, no, that's not what you're going to do with the rest of your life. God's called you to something else. Folks, as I look back on that, he was speaking prophetically into my life. I didn't recognize it. We didn't think that way at that time, but I can see that he was doing that. We were newly married, probably married just a few months, and I used to go home from those times and I'd say to Corlin, that bugs me when he says that. What right does he have to say what God's calling me to? And that just bothers me. You know what was happening there? That old calling from probably 10 years before, was his words were hitting a nerve there. And I was being reminded of that call. I'll spare you all the details, but I remember it was a cold morning in July, excuse me, July, not July, January. In 1980, uh, we were in. We had bought a house in Haver. We were really settled in, and we were sitting in. The, I was sitting in this little house over a heat vent. <laughs> it was very poorly insulated. Corlin had gone off to work already. She worked in a legal, uh, a lawyer's office, and uh, I had a later shift that day. So I was spending time with the Lord, and uh, God was stirring my heart. There's a change coming. There's a change coming. And so I remember I said, Lord, I'll do anything you want. Now, I'd said that before in my life, but this time, folks, I mean, I meant it with my whole heart. I'll do anything you want. I was washed suddenly with a peace from God. No direction at that point, but an incredible peace and sense of his presence. Well, of course, Corlin and I talked together, and that's a long story. I won't go into it, but uh, later that year in 
September of 1980. We headed off to Northwest College. You know, back in those days, of course, you didn't do anything online because we didn't know what online meant. But today you can get education online. Well, we, back in those days, you went to a school. That's what we did. We went to a school. We, I spent two years at Northwest finishing up a degree. And uh, we said, okay, Lord, what's next? We got a call from a church in Billings, Montana, Park Hill Assembly of God, pastored by Bob Fox. What a great guy. Very strong pastoral anointing in his life. And... Uh, I was their part-time music pastor, okay? Uh, Corlin, Corlin and I are both very involved in music. So part-time music pastor we started in, but it quickly grew into other things. Bob gave me a lot of freedom in ministering in other ways. I preached, I taught uh, classes, I oversaw their CE department, I did hospital visitation, number of different things. So I was growing in pastoral ministry, but the only models I'd had for ministry were the role models of the pastors I'd had as a boy in Haver, okay? And I'm going to call those the traditional role, and I'll explain that in a moment. But the traditional role, basically, at this point, I want to tell you, is the pastor did everything, okay? Did everything in the church. And that was my role model. So that's kind of the way I started doing ministry. I just started doing a lot of things, which that's not all bad. I learned a lot of things, but it's not the greatest model. Now... At this time in ministry, I began to get stirred up over Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. And it, of course, that scripture says the ministry gifts are given to equip the church for ministry. You can see them on the screen there. It says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So it isn't the pastors that are supposed to be doing everything while the church watches. No, we're a body, and each one of us has gifts from God that are to be used in building the kingdom. And I think Mike's been going over that with you. So that began stirring in my heart, but it was so against what I'd been taught and what had been modeled for me. But I thought, okay, I guess pastors aren't supposed to be doing everything, but we're to be equipping the saints, as one translation says, were to be equipping the church to do ministry. It was at this time that Corlin and I met a wonderful couple in the church who were much older than us. They were probably 25 to 30 years older than us. We were just starting out. At that point, we hadn't even had any children yet. Uh, they had raised their two boys. They didn't have any grandkids. So they just reached out to us, loved us. They were very financially comfortable. We were struggling, of course, early years of marriage. Uh, ministry didn't pay much. And so they would bless us. They'd take us out to dinner. They'd take us boating. They'd have us over to their house for games. And we just really built a friendship there. But they were very, very traditional people. Very traditional. And the woman was not afraid to speak her mind to me, and she'd often uh, tell me how we as her pastors were not quite living up to what we should do. She says, you know, you pastors, you need to do more hospital visitation. You need to visit shut-ins more. You know, you need to preach better sermons. You need to see people get saved. You know, uh, and, the, and the sign on the church, it looks bad. You ought to fix that. And so she had quite a list of things that she thought needed to be done. You know, so I remember saying to her, you know, but Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 says that the leaders of the church, the pastors and so on, are to equip the saints for service, 
So he equipped the church to operate in their giftings. No, 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 she said. She would say to me, that's what we pay the pastor to do. I said, well, I don't think so. I said, you know, right here in Ephesians 4, it says, and she'd turn to her husband and she'd say, this must be some new teaching they're teaching at Bible college. <laughs> our dear friend, and both she and her husband are deceased now, but our dear friend had a very traditional view, is that's what I call it, of a pastor. And honestly, folks, as I mentioned to you, that was the view of a pastor I'd been raised with. I like what I heard Pastor Mike call it, being a spiritual, excuse me, a spiritual ambulance. Every time there's a need, send the pastor to take care of it. What's the traditional view? Again, I, I wrote down a few things. They're the main leader of a church. Okay, they're the guy and. In our setting, it was usually a guy, although I am thankful that the Assemblies of God uh, credentials women and ordains them and so on. But it was usually the guy who was the main leader of a church. They preach regularly and usually are the only one who does. They administrate everything in the church. They take care of the books. They decide who teaches the third graders. They uh, paint the bathrooms when it's needed. They mow the lawn. They do everything. Uh, they represent the church and the community well at prayer breakfasts, at Kiwanis garage sale, at sporting events, what have you. They do funerals, weddings, water baptisms, child dedications, and so on. They visit people in the hospital, and woe to the pastor who doesn't visit your cousin who's in the hospital, even though you may not have mentioned it to him. Uh, they counsel people in trouble and a whole bunch of other things. I call it MISC period because that was the first job description I ever had as a pastor. And job descriptions are important. But I remember at the end it said MISC period. <laughs> Anything else? That tends to be the general traditional view that many people have had of a pastor. The pastor does the church stuff. So we don't have to be bothered with that. And they're usually the only one or one of the few who are qualified to do so. But friends, and I think I'm speaking to people who understand this, that's not what Paul is talking about in this fourth chapter of Ephesians. Paul is talking about a gifting from Jesus. True pastors are gifts from Jesus to his church. But hear this, I want you to hear this clearly. I believe there may be many pastors in a house like this. You say, well, what do you mean many pastors? We have Mike and, you know, we have other staff, but no, I'm talking about this gifting. I'm not saying that next Sunday you're going to stand up here and say, I'm taking over as pastor of this church. Of course not. But I'm talking about people with the pastoral gifting, a gifting to love and care for others deeply and move and work in this body and throughout this community with a pastoral heart that Jesus gave you, a special grace from the Lord to love and care for others. What is a pastor? I think most of you are aware of this, but I'll review it quickly. The term Paul uses in this section actually means shepherd, shepherd. Now, of course, that's kind of an archaic term to us. Uh, we don't use it much anymore just out in real life. But um, in Paul's day, they would have understood it more clearly. A shepherd is one who tends a flock of sheep. They care for them. They, they guard them. They feed them. Uh, they guide them, they protect the sheep. So a shepherd oversees a group of sheep to make sure they're well, they're well cared for. Why? Why do they do that? Not just for a paycheck, but they do it primarily because they love sheep. Shepherds love sheep. Jesus used the shepherd picture in John 10 when he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Well, then, 
put that in the pastor category. What does a pastor shepherd do? Well, Jesus would say, a pastor lays down his life for the sheep, for the, for the people. Because they love sheep so much, people so much, they don't want any, come, any, any harm to come to them. So a pastor just loves people dearly. A pastor oversees people in a gentle and loving way and guards and protects them and cares for them and feeds them. This is where it gets a little bit confusing in our church world because sometimes we use the term pastor rather loosely. I've, I've seen TV evangelists, for, for instance, who are doing a great job, but they're referred to as pastor. But that's really perhaps not their gifting. Or others may be apostolic, and yet we refer to them as pastor. I think Pastor Mike went over that with his own testimony, that he's very apostolic, and thank God for that. I love to hear his vision and so on. Um, so some who we refer to as pastor actually have a strong gifting in another area. So that can get confusing, can't it? We still refer to them as pastor, but they may be more apostolic or prophetic or teacher or evangelism. Uh, that may be their gifting. I always think of a pastor I knew here in Montana. He's retired now, been retired for a number of years. But um, God used him to build a strong church. He was very visionary, a great preacher. I mean, this guy was a preacher of preachers. And uh, grew, God used him to grow a great, strong church. But I remember somebody said about him one day, you know, he's a great guy, but he just doesn't like people. I thought, what? A pastor who doesn't like people? Now, that was an overstatement because I know the man personally. He likes people, but you know, after he got done preaching, he'd usually head for a side door and go to his office where pastors tend to mingle with people and love them and <laughs> how are you doing, pray with them. You see, that wasn't his strong gifting. Uh, if he had a choice of sitting with someone and holding their hand and praying with them and crying with them and loving on them, or go prepare a sermon, he'd go prepare a sermon. That was his gifting. You know what he did, though? He very wise thing. He hired a man who was strong in the pastoral grace. And that man was his main associate. And that man covered the bases, and the church was loved. And that man helped equip others to love others. So the, the bases was, were covered. I remember a few years ago having lunch with a pastor who was in the process of building a strong church, a thriving church. He was very visionary. But this young man, he's younger than me, but he said to me, you know, you're much more of a pastor than I am. And folks, even though I've taught on this and lived it, I hope, for years, that struck me funny because I thought, yeah, but you've got this big thing going. And then it dawned on me what he's talking about. He's talking about these giftings and that his gifting was more apostolic. Mine was more pastoral. Okay. Earmarks of this pastoral gifting. Number one, a deep, deep love for people. I think that almost goes without saying, but a deep love for people. There's an old joke among pastors that goes like this. I'd sure love the ministry if it wasn't for people. <clears throat> Folks, I got news for you. If there, wasn't, if there weren't people, there'd be no ministry. People are the ministry. And of course, it is a joke. Pastors love people. In Philippians 1, it gives us a look at the heart of Paul. Now, Paul is primarily a, an apostle that's a different gifting, of course. Mike already talked on that, taught on that. But um, I believe that we can have a gift mix, and I believe Paul probably had a gift mix of apostolic and pastoral grace. Because look what he says in Philippians 1, 3 through 8. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. 
In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And then I love this next section. He says, it's right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Folks, that's just dripping with pastoral love <laughs> for these people. Oh, how Paul loved them. Just a few comments regarding this pastoral grace. I love how Paul said he was thinking of them, praying for them. Pastors reflect on and are thankful for people. Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you. Corlin and I, as I mentioned to you, we're in a different season of our ministry right now where we serve churches as interim pastors. I, I think we're on our seventh church now or something like that. We'll often reflect on someone and in the church we serve and comment on what a gift they are. And like I said, right now we're serving in the Chinook Assembly of God and, and we've made some lifelong friendships there. And what a gift that is. And, and we'll often pray for them, the things they're going through. And friends, Mike mentioned earlier that we're going to do an impartation at the close of this service. And I believe that you who receive an impartation of grace, uh, you're going to find yourself giving thanks for people. You're going to find yourself just being so joyful that they're in your life and that God placed them there. Of course, another one is pastors pray for their people. Paul tells about praying with joy for the people he's gotten to know. I have a list of people I pray for, church people, pastors in need, family issues, and so on. And again, as you receive impartation today, I believe this pastoral grace will move in your life in even a greater way than you have experienced yet. And you'll find yourself praying over issues and situations uh, that, are, that are on your heart. And by the way, I encourage you to pray in your prayer, prayer language that God has given you. That is so powerful, and I know you've received teachings on that. Pastors have people in their hearts. I love verse 7. It puts the pastoral call in such special terms when Paul says, I have you in my heart. This really sums up what pastoring is all about, having people in your heart. And quite honestly, sometimes this is the difficult part of pastoring. When you have people in your heart and you see them or their family heading in a direction that you know it will not end well, and you've worked with them and you've prayed with them and you've tried to encourage them to go a different direction, but they go their own way. I can remember times just laying on my office floor and weeping over issues because I had these people in my heart. Well, secondly, pastors protect the people they serve, just like a shepherd protects the flock against predators that might try to come in. Um, thankfully, Jesus said, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. One of the most common ways the enemy tries to attack the church is, interestingly enough, from within through murmuring and complaining. One man calls that the worship sounds of hell. Ooh, those are strong words, aren't they? But sometimes people will come to you with issues, and I, I know what church life is like. Sometimes there's murmuring and complaining, and you know what? When you have this pastoral gifting on you, this grace, you can just quietly, politely and kindly, but just shut that down, say, you know what? Let's not go there right now. Let's agree in prayer together for that situation and let's not spread it further and so on. So that's just a better way to handle it. Sometimes guarding the flock needs to be strong. And I, I of course, suggest you let leadership and pastor 
handle difficult situations. But I know as a pastor in, the, in, in my time serving churches, I've actually had to ask people to leave. Not very often. I think it happened twice in 22 years that I served hell in a neighborhood. And boy, it goes against my nature because <laughs> pastors don't want to lose anybody. But when somebody comes in to cause trouble or stir up issues that should not be dealt with by them, uh, I had to do that. It was so against my nature. But like I say, let's let leadership do that if that ever happens here. Well, thirdly, pastors want the church to mature in every way. That almost goes without saying, but I, I want to say it today. I used to say, you know, uh, pastors want the church to be all that it can be. Sounds like an army recruiter, doesn't it? But it's true. Pastors want, want the church just to be all that it can be. At one time, I thought pastoring meant simply getting people saved and headed for heaven. Now, Obviously, those are important, but there's so much more. Paul says in Philippians 1, 9 through 11, he says, This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. That's more than just seeing people get saved and headed for heaven, but that's seeing them grow and mature and be all that they can be for God, grow in the spirit realm, to see his kingdom firmly established in Fairfield and the surrounding area. And that will only happen as we love each other from the depths of our hearts, and it means Loving those who are easy to love and those who may not be that easy to love. Now, in closing, I want to refer to one other thing, and that's one of the Apostle Paul's favorite phrases, and that's one another. One another. You ever notice in Scripture how many times the phrase one another is used? Paul talked over and over about how we as believers should treat one another and really treat everyone we come in contact with. Here are a few of the ad ad admonishments. Love one another. Serve one another. Encourage one another. Bear one another's burdens. Don't judge one another. Speak truth to one another. Comfort one another. Be at peace with one another. Accept one another. Be kind to one another. And forgive one another. I like to call it one anothering. <laughs> in other words, we are to care for and love one another in this house with our whole beings. I was thinking about this this week as I prepared my heart for this day. What will this church look like? Already a great church, but when this pastoral grace of loving and caring for one another gets loosed in a fresh and new way. I pray that this develops a passion from Holy Spirit to care for one another deeply. I pray that there is such a culture of honoring one another, serving one another, forgiving one another when necessarily, and truly loving one another deeply. Loving people. That's what this pastoral grace does. And as was mentioned, we're going to have an opportunity in a moment to simply lay hands on those who'd like to see an increase in this area of having a pastor's heart. We want to simply impart a passion to care for people, to deeply love one another, so that this place 
gets even a stronger reputation than it has right now. I believe it has a great reputation, but even a stronger reputation of, oh, how they love one another in that house. And if you go in that place, you're going to be loved. Pastor Mike. The Bible's clear that Jesus calls certain people at certain times to the fivefold ministry of pastor. And if, if you feel like Jesus has called you to be a pastor, one who equips others, then we want to facilitate that. We want to encourage you in that. Come come visit with me. We can we can talk that through. We wanna we wanna help launch you into that area. It's for a select few people, and Jesus will be the one that will call you to that. But here's what I know. Every believer in Jesus Christ is called to have a pastoral heart, like Norm said. And that's what we're really about today, that when you walk out of this place, you have a passion to care for people that you didn't previously have, or maybe not as strong. I remember when I first started pastoring, or when God called me to be a pastor, I wanted to see people get saved. I was saved, of course, and I, I wanted to see people get saved. I knew it was important, but to say that I had a burning desire for that would not have been true. But I knew I needed that to be a pastor, so I just, God, if you're calling me to be a pastor and you are, give me the desire for people who don't know you, that they can know you. And he did, he did, just supernaturally imparted that to me. and so. Caring for people is not easy. It's rarely convenient. And, and that's why you need that passion to do it. And so that's what Pastor Norm and Coraline are going to be imparting to you. So why don't you stand up as we close in a time of worship and impartation this morning. And I'm, I'm going to ask you, uh, actually, no, we have a, uh, Cameron's our prayer time person. And... Uh, is Donna in here for prayer time? Whoever are prayer time people, yeah. So Cameron and Donna, would you guys come up like on either side? Like, yeah. And Donna, if you want to go clear over on that side, maybe. And then uh, Norm and Coraline are going to, they're going to come up here kind of towards the center. If you have a prayer need for anything at all, uh, our prayer people are here to pray for that. And you can come up to them. So move, would you move further out to the side there, Donna? Thank you. We're just going to give more room for other people. Um, you can come to them, and they're going to pray for you for whatever need you have. If you, were, if you just want that impartation, uh, the grace of the pastoral heart that, that Norm carries, um, that he wants, that the Lord wants to impart to you, then just come up and stand in front here. And like everybody just come at once and, and just stand and he's just gonna work his way through laying hands on you and imparting that pastoral grace, that, that supernatural empowerment that gives you a passion to care and love people so that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus on this earth, all right? So if you want that impartation, I'm gonna ask you to come up right now. Just come on, for, just step out from where you're at. Come right on up and just, just kind of just stand across the front here and Norm is just going to start working his way across laying hands on you and I, I know that I know that when you walk out of this place you will be different than when you came in Lord I just pray for a special time of anointing Lord we know that this is what you want we know that we know you want your people to have a greater desire for care and love for others and Lord, we know that we don't carry that in and of ourselves to the degree that it needs to be there, but you can give it to us. And we're asking for that now in the mighty name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.